and making sure that um, things are going well for our veterans out there. Uh, and she has a guest, uh, Jasper Craven. So Suzanne. and Veteran Healthcare Policy Institute. Uh, just an incredible background. And then Jasper Craven is the Interim Executive Director for VHPI. I'm welcoming both of you. And today our talk is going to be centered on veterans' mental health and the future of veteran suicide prevention under the Biden's administration. Welcome, welcome, welcome. This is a wonderful discussion topic. Um, so who would like to lead off? Um, well, it, Jasper, is Jasper on? Yeah, I'm here. Yes. Okay. So, um, well, uh, let me just start. Uh, Veterans Healthcare Policy Institute just released a report, um, about, um, the mental, the, what good policy making, uh, for mental health care and suicide prevention should be in in not only the VA but outside the VA and we did this report with um, Russell Lemley who was the chief psychologist at the San Francisco VA for over 30 years Hal Cudler who is a psychiatrist Russell is a is a psychologist Hal Cudler who is a psychiatrist and was the chief consultant for mental health and mental health policy at VA central office and Joe, Dr. Uh, Joseph Ruzick, who uh, was at the National Center, the VA's National Center for PTSD. And the, the four and I was another uh, uh, participant, uh, writer of this report. And basically, we're very concerned that policymaking around mental health care in Congress and suicide prevention is very haphazard, uncoordinated, and one bill is passed and, and, you know, senators or Congress people can look like they're supporting veterans, but the, the bills may be poorly crafted or they're not implemented or there's no evaluation and then they do another bill and then they do another bill and then there's a presidential executive order and then the DOD does something and you end up having a hodgepodge of uncoordinated programs that often don't address the issue, but perhaps make congressmen and senators look like they're addressing the issue when they're really not. And we offer a bunch of recommendations for what good policy making around mental health and suicide prevention looks like, and and also you know give some warnings about what bad policy making looks like and and sadly um there's in our view while congress is very well intentioned and folks may be very well intentioned they're pushing things that actually aren't going to make a difference for a variety of reasons that that we could go into and i think jasper might want to jump in and, and say something if that's okay oh sure absolutely yeah, that's, that sounds really interesting, this fragmentation of programs, and that's really due to poor policy making and crafting of bills. That's really um, an extremely important thing to focus on. So what, what's your uh, take on it, Jasper? Yeah, well, I think that um, certainly what Suzanne says is, is really the overarching message we're trying to spread here. But I would add that a real issue these days is that um, – Lawmakers are so eager um, for innovation uh, in the in addressing veteran uh, mental health and the suicide crisis, and certainly innovation is welcome and necessary. But the thing is, is that the VA is doing the lion's share of innovation here. I mean, it was the VA that first pushed for. Uh, the creation of PTSD in the first place following the Vietnam War. It was the VA that surveyed hundreds of thousands of Vietnam veterans to understand what they were feeling and how it could be addressed. They have pioneered all of the major evidence-based mental, mental health treatments that have also been adopted uh, 
by civilian providers. And so the argument that we often hear in Congress today is that what's required because the suicide crisis has been so um, difficult to completely quash is we need the sort of the hand of the private sector to offer innovation to do things that the VA cannot. But oftentimes what this means is that the private sector is offering treatments that don't have evidence, that have not been rigorously tested in peer-reviewed trials. And so there's a really big risk here that veterans are diverted from the VA, which, well, far from perfect and, you know, well, not armed with, with a panacea that can cure PTSD, has the best treatment options available and instead are put into a private sector provider that doesn't help them in a serious way. And that can lead to really uh, serious consequences, including them perhaps deciding that, you know, no treatment at all could help them and sort of shunning evidence-based treatments in the VA and falling deeper into despair. So, you know, these are just massive questions um, that, many lawmakers don't fully seem to understand as they move forward in policy making. Yeah, that's uh, very interesting because when you were talking, I was just thinking uh, many of the things that came from the military, you know, even going back to um, some of the sulfur drugs that we use um, and then the treatments for people who have um, physical disabilities, uh, you know, that have lost a limb, uh, and that, that, you know, the uh, biomechanical devices that we use now for, you know, artificial limbs, all that came through the VA. And the VA has always been like a pioneer in science, and it's always been really focused on the population of VA patients um, as time goes on. It's, then it goes into the private sector, and they, they uh, sort of benefit from what come, that's come out of the evidence-based kind of approach that the military has taken through the VA. So this is really, it's kind of an interesting uh, kind of uh, confrontation between, uh, you know, innovation in the private sector versus the VA, where um, what you're saying sounds so logical that it's not based uh, always on uh, the uh, things that uh, you would need as far as having evidence-based and peer-reviewed kinds of uh, studies. Well, and also it's kind of um, um, ironic that, the private sector would be looked at to remedy mental health problems. Mm -hmm. The private sector has completely failed in addressing the mental health crisis in the broader society. Mm -hmm. There is a massive suicide crisis in the broader society, and it hasn't made any progress in addressing that. And so the notion that this is the notion that the private sector has the answer to mental health and suicide prevention is really ludicrous. I mean, something like 41% of, um, I, I sometimes reverse them, but um, of bipolar disorder and 50% of schizophrenia in the private sector, in the broader healthcare system, which really isn't a system, it's more, as someone once put it, an arrangement. Um, and an, I'm not even sure you could call it an arrangement, but um, it, it's it's untreated in the private sector. I mean, jails and prisons are the private sector mental health system. So, you know, one could argue that, and I would even not argue this, but one could maybe argue that in the private sector you could deal with colonoscopies and, and urology, but the idea that you could look to the private sector for effective mental health treatment and suicide prevention would be laughable were it not so tragic. And a lot of these bills, I mean, the recommendations that we make in this paper, uh, which we have gotten a lot of good feedback on, and I would encourage people to go to veteranspolicy.org, our website, and see the paper, we say you know, you you can't send people to private sector providers unless you know that they have rigorous training in the care of veterans specifically, that they have a track record in dealing with evidence-based practice and mental health, that they have a track record in actually preventing suicides, which none of these bills require. Um, hmm. You can't, you know, you can't uh, put forth bills and pass legislation that mandates that the VA do certain things without funding it and staffing it. So you have these unfunded and unstaffed staff mandates. 
that we have private sector providers. Uh, we we say that private sector providers, if they take care of veterans, should be required to get training in um, all these evidence-based uh, practices or any practices, and which and what by training we don't mean you know two hours online in front of a computer. We mean what they do at the VA which is four-day workshops followed by six months intensive supervision. And, okay. and our requirements are very, there's many of them, so I, I don't want to take up too much oxygen with that. But you, you, you have to have a template, a checklist against which to evaluate legislative proposals. Because in Congress, quite frankly, you know, every congressperson and senator wants their name on some bill. And they want to be perceived to be veteran friendly. So you present them with something around suicide prevention and mental health. And oftentimes they will sponsor it without even reading it. Yes, yes. Yeah, that's one of the, da- that's one of the dangers I know is that uh, many times the, um, the legislators themselves actually don't have a background in mental health. Um, or they, they rely on, uh, you, know, uh, you know, a clipping or a report that they hear. And, uh, you know, as you, as you were saying, uh, many times their, under, you know, their staff will, uh, p- you know, craft or put something together, and they're just really the signatory on that because they have so many other bills and so many things to, you know, to do. And, you know, it just seems like, uh, you know, to me, if I were to try to take care of somebody, I would have to really intimately know what type of uh, P- PTSD they are actually experiencing as well. I mean, we have a tendency to put everything into a basket and think that PTSD, you know, if my dog passes away, that's PTSD, right? And, uh, (laughs) you know, so, you know, uh, we have really a loose definition of what this means now in society. But the veterans who have gone through uh, these tragic um, encounters where they saw their, uh, you know, service members who were their battle buddies die, or you know, uh, to see that uh, people, um, you know, uh, you know, actually be injured yourself or be exposed to that, you know, it's a, to- it's a totally different kind of picture. And especially if you have multiple repeated uh, times of going into a combat zone, unlike you know some of the other wars where you had one tour, maybe two tours, we have people going for four, five, six tours of duty. And, uh, you know, that it really has a heavy impact. So it really needs to be studied in and of itself. And then what you're talking about, I think it's, it's absolutely, you know, it's obvious to me that you need to have this done in a, an environment where people are adept at handling this and no veterans. Yeah, and, and, you know, I mean, frankly, the problem with the private sector and they, these private sector providers have said this over and over and over again, that they're happy to take taxpayer money to treat veterans, but they are not happy to put in even a minimal amount of time to un- understand veteran-specific problems. I mean, look, I'm a woman, and in the medical system in the private sector, probably all over, doesn't even want to study us, you know, and we're 50% of the population. They don't want to put us in their research studies because we have confounding variables like, you know, menopause or periods or whatever. Mm. And why would any, why would they want to study, you know, one to 5% of their, of their patients? Uh, I mean, veterans are one to 5% of the, of the, of, you know, um, Americans, right? Right. And it makes absolutely no sense for, for that doctor over there to take, you know, 10 hours or 20 or six months to learn about veterans when maybe he'll have five patients, you know, a year. And, but these legislators just don't want to consider that. And, and I don't know how much time we have left. Um, yes. Yeah, we have, we have what, like I about one minute to go. So, uh, but, you know, go ahead and, and maybe, finish your thoughts. Well, maybe yeah. Jasper could just talk about the, the money behind this because, you know, the, the lobbying money now behind this. Yeah, I mean, um, it's a, it's it's a long story, and I won't tell it all. But you know, essentially, since the VA first was um, opened up to private sector providers, there has been this massive sub industry in the healthcare, uh, the private healthcare world, to get these taxpayer dollars. And what we have seen in the many years we've been covering this is just a very quick proliferation of groups that claim to be offering. Uh, veteran-centric 
primary and mental health care, uh, as well as, you know, other forms of contractors to process payments and do administrative work. And they are seeing money pour in. Um, So, you know, thank you. yeah, but, but we're actually we're running out, we ran out of time. But uh, you know, I want you, people to go to veteranspolicy.org, and Jasper, uh, we have got to have you back, and Suzanne. We always have love having you here, and uh, you know, thank you for being a partner, uh, VHPI. But we want you to come back because this is such an important topic, and for suicide to be continuing is unconscionable. These legislators need to do something that makes sense and look at your policies and what you're saying. But thank, thank you both. You.